You're listening to Change Your POV Podcast, episode 91. The infirmities that other people will see in the elderly are not the infirmities that the elderly see in themselves. I forget where I saw it, but I saw a very inspiring video of a man in a wheelchair building a barbecue grill from with brick and mortar, lifting sandbags, all from a wheelchair. Welcome to Change Your POV Podcast, helping you navigate transitions in your life like entering and exiting college or the military, changing jobs or careers, and providing you with the coaching and mentorship needed to help you advance in your personal or professional life. Sometimes all you need is to change your point of view. Now, here's your host, Eddie Lazary. Hello, folks, and welcome to Change Your POV Podcast. I am your host, Eddie Lazary, and I'm going to be doing a solo show with our guest, Mr. Lee Mowat. Now, Mr. Lee Mowat is a 66-year-old senior citizen with gray hair, (laughs) retired software engineer, husband and father, and is the oldest person on YouTube to execute a round-off a round off back handspring on the floor. And we're going to include the video to that in the show notes page of this episode. He uses his handstands as an icebreaker when meeting people. He is devoted to changing the perspective of the elderly and those who care for them and is the host of his own podcast, The Inner Game of Aging. And of course, let's not forget, Lee is also the unofficial mascot of Change Your POV. (laughs) <laughs> how are you doing lee i'm doing fantastic fantastic <laughs> absolutely so the listeners of change your pov uh have heard a lot about uh about you through my you know for me and through bennett and of course you and i did an episode not too long ago about the mastermind group and the yes. links yeah the links to that will also be in the show notes of this episode today I've asked you to come on and share your 66 years of history and knowledge um, around the areas of health and fitness and just wellness in general. And then, of course, let's uh, we're going to be talking about what you do in, in terms of uh, your podcast and your message as well. But before we get into any of that, I would like to thank today's podcast sponsor, Audible.com. It, so... Audible.com, you can get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial today by heading over to changeyourpov.com forward slash free book with over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. There is sure to be something that interests you. Search through all kinds of genres like uh, fiction, nonfiction, education, self-help, comedy, short story, and novels with an our commute to and from work every single day. I use this time to listen to all kinds of books. Right now, I what are you listening to right now, Lee? Oh, I listen to uh, so many podcasts that uh, you know, like the mo- one book I have on my phone right now is Money by Tony Robinson. Oh, nice, Tony That's... Robinson. Yeah, yeah. And so, but most of my listening right now, of course, I listen to Change Your POV and a whole bunch of other podcasts that are just so valuable to me. I actually, what's nice about Audible.com is once you, if somebody recommends a book to me, which happens quite often, I can go on to Audible and I can actually uh, search for the book, find it, and I can add it to my uh, my wish list. So that way I don't have to try to remember what book that was that somebody recommended me. I can just go to my wish list, uh, grab whichever book is in. I got actually probably like 30 books on my wish list. But right now I'm currently listening to a book called Sell or Be Sold by Grant Cardone. And if you've never listened to that or read that book, I highly recommend you do so. So again, you can head on over to changeyourpov.com forward slash free book for your free audio download and your free 30-day 
trial. So, tell the listener a little bit more about who is Lee and what are you all about? Well, Lee is really much more ordinary than he makes himself out to be. <laughs> it's it's about living. It's about being who you are authentically. So, um, maybe I should start around about 11 years ago when I had a very, very severe accident. I've always been rather controversial in my thinking, at least others may describe me that way. But since that accident, I've seen so much about me, others. It was just a total eye-opener um, eye just to come that close to death. It's, it doesn't leave you the same way. One of the things I saw, Ed, now, my body was very broken from that accident. It took me four months to recover. And during the course of that time, I watched my body heal, and it was the most amazing thing to me just to watch my body heal. Now, the damage to my body was quite significant, but we have soldiers coming back from Afghanistan and other countries that are in far worse shape than I am. And I tell you, this accident just gave me the greatest respect for those people who are coming back wounded and are trying to regain a sense of life. I, you know, it, it just floored me. But Ed, you have no idea what it's like to watch people run around, save your life, doing this, doing that, and you can do nothing but watch them. It's a very transforming experience. Now, you you, you talked about injury. What was it? I mean, was it... Uh... How did you, what happened? What kind of accident was it? It was a, I was riding my motorcycle. I'm a very avid motorcyclist. And um, I was coming home from work one day and I was driving along the road. And I noticed this Buick that was looking odd to me. It turns out it was a new driver, a 17 year old kid who had the sun in his eyes and decided to make the left turn anyway. Well, my leg was caught in between the bike and the Buick. It was pulverized. That wasn't the main damage at the time because I had head injuries, lung injuries, and God knows what else. But it turned out my leg was quite, quite damaged. The doctor wanted to have it severed. It was that bad. My wife came on the scene and insisted that the doctor did not sever the leg. It was against the doctor's medical judgment to not sever the leg. She said, Miss, this man's going to have a problem with this leg for the rest of his life. He will probably never use it in a normal manner again. About six months later, I walked into that doctor's office and started jumping around a bit. And <laughs> I, um, I wasn't fully recovered in terms of the leg at that point, but he can see that I was well on my way to using the leg. And to this day, I'm very surprised you can barely see a limp in me. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just learning about the body, learning who to trust in terms of understanding my own body, understanding what I'm capable of, and understanding what you are capable of, what everyone's capable of, and we don't know it. Right. And so since that time, I've been on a passionate tear to find out both my mental and spiritual and physical limits. I have no idea what they are. So let me ask you this. You, you specialize in the area of aging, and that's really what your message is centered around. Um, and that's something that interests me at, at pushing 40 years old. I'm not considered really <laughs> old, right? But but uh, I think I think at that age, right, around four, between your 40s and 50s, I think you start to reflect on your life, where you've come, where you are, and, and, and where you're going, right? Uh, yes. Some people call it midlife crisis or whatever. I wouldn't really consider it a crisis. But, you know, it, the number of years that you have ahead of you are numbered, and you really start to understand that and, and appreciate that. In your experience, do you see people that are aging as um, – defeated or do you see them as encouraged do you see i mean what is the 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 average i know this is a difficult question to ask but the mindset of those that are aging and elderly because and and, and let me before you answer mm -hmm. i just have to, i have to preface the question 
because oftentimes as a 40 year old um, and even before before my age now, um, it's I, you watch commercials, you watch TV, you, it's just kind of ingrained in us even on social media that people of you know the the elder age are um, incompetent, incapable, uh, dinosaurs, a, a drain on society, um, no longer earners in the economy, right? And so, and and. It just, uh, it, I don't know. What are your, what's your take it, on that it's, mentality? It's, it's funny because we live in a society, in a culture that is extremely youth oriented. Now, when you're focused on one side of the fence, it's hard to notice what's on the other side of the fence. And in fact, it's easy to mislabel what's on the other side of the fence because you're not focused there. We find that we find that the older we get, the more, or excuse me, the less we mind our aging bodies. We also find that at, as we get older, we don't feel as bad as we thought we would. Now, this comes as a surprise to uh, some people, but it becomes reality for others who have been taught that getting older is a weakening. It's a, you know, it's less than, not more than. To me, Ed, I've become so much more than I was at 40. Pardon me, I know you're 40, but, but I would not want to return to that age. I am 66, and I would not want to return to 40. I enjoy myself so much more at 66 than I ever did at 40. And I'm seeing that in a uniform fashion, more or less. Of course, there's a segment of our population around my age that is feeling this, what we'll call a crisis of confidence. We know that we live in a youth-oriented society and that the stereotypes that you just expressed are rampant among, among our culture. And so we can take in these stereotypes and start to use these stereotypes to affect us, ourselves, our thinking, our lives, and we create a lifestyle that brings these stereotypes about. Or we can fight these stereotypes. You can realize that they're just stereotypes that there's nothing that makes them true except for us so so do you think that do you think older people perpetuate that stereotype they bring it on to themselves or they just succumb to that stereotype and think oh i guess that's the way it is or well i'm going to answer that but you asked the question by saying do you think older people there are many types of older people and i'm going to include talk about two types those that do not recognize the stereotypes that they were taught under and those that do. Now, those of us who do not recognize how we come to learn the framework of culture and conventions that we do, we will be start to assume these stereotypes and make them our reality. But those people who are aware that we have another a kind of level of learning that comes from osmosis and that we can fight that kind of learning, that the truths in our society don't, don't have to be our personal truths. Those of us who understand that can look at these stereotypes, live amongst them, and be more immune to them. So it depends on where, you, where your mind is. You can't just summarize older people as all of one type, just mm. as you can't summarize 40 year olds as all of one type. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's very interesting, right? So you've seen the, uh, you know, you, you hear things all the time. I'll just use this as an example because a lot of people recognize this. Uh, even when we, you know, I was in the military and I worked with mostly men. Um, sometimes you would see uh, a, a new soldier come into the unit and, and to be very kind of common to say something like, man, you run like a girl. Right. <laughs> or or, you know, you're out playing football with the boys and you say something like, well, you throw like a girl. Right. So yeah. so it's this very common expression to do or, or you know, walk like a girl, talk like a girl, throw like a girl. And then it really raises the question, what does that mean? Exactly. Like, what does that mean? Like a girl. And there was a commercial uh, not too long ago where uh, they really capitalize on that thought, it, where it showed, you know, professional women athletes doing all these things, you know, hitting the ball and throwing a ball and, and running and, and, you know, and they're all professionals in their field and they're saying, yeah, we're doing it like a girl. Well, you take that same mentality and you bring it over to 
uh, the 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 um, the older folks, right? And there's many things that we say, you know, that we kind of use that same type of logic, that same Absolutely. type of mentality, right? Like and an it's old always person. derogatory. It's always derogatory. You know, right. You're, old, you're older. You, you, of course, you don't remember that. You're a bit older now. These yeah. Days, you, know? now you recently yeah. you recently interviewed uh, a ninety plus year old uh, a ge- right. gentleman, and he was singing. And you said and a wonderful, strong voice. Yeah, and you even and you said you said you know you have a wonderful voice for a ninety-year-old or a ninety-plus-year-old, and it really begs the question. And I think you even asked it. I caught wh- myself. Yes. What What does a ninety-year-old voice supposed to sound like? <laughs> right? Exactly. When I introduce myself to others and I and they find out my age. What typically happens, and I can watch this happen as soon as I find out my age, is I have violated their own impression, not mine, but their own impression of what a 66-year-old is like. Right. And where did they get that impression from? From our cultures around us, from our stereotypes around us. And so when I defy those stereotypes, people come to me and says, you're 66? That can't be. Mm. Right? Yeah. I'm simply defying a a stereotype, which is encouraging them to say what they're saying. We understand, Ed, we understand now more closely than we did years ago, that getting older is a biological process. I repeat this quite a bit. You may have heard me say this before. Getting older is a biological process. I, I am 66 years old. There's no changing that. But getting old, not older, but getting old is a mental and spiritual process. It has nothing to do with getting older. Hmm. And so, you know, it's our, when, our, when our mentality and our spirit starts to break down. Now, what causes our spirit to break down? Well, here we get back into the culture again. When we are taught that we will be old, we will be frail, we will be forgetful, no matter how strong we are, these sort of images being playing on our minds since when we're 40 years old or younger start to take their effect and the you know nothing controls how you will age more than how you believe you will age Mm -hmm. and so you know you can stay healthy all you want and i advocate a very healthy lifestyle i'm you know no slouch there but it's your thinking that is going to really determine how well you're engaged in life, the social connections you make, and these have tremendous effect on your health and well-being. You know, you often hear, I've often heard, that uh, people tend to go, quote-unquote, downhill once they retire. Their, Their health uh, uh, starts to yeah. starts to deteriorate their uh, sense of purpose starts to deteriorate they 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 grow more uh, depressed is so talk to me about and that may not be your personal experience i know you're retired well, it, it but, is it is my personal experience oh okay and the, and the personal experience of many friends the i have many friends who have since retired and have not found the structure the purpose the connections that they had at work you work often gives us a structure that supports our lives in more ways than we realize until the time it goes away. And so after retirement, it is essential, Ed, that we devote our lives to something that's higher than just us. You can play golf every day, and I can assure you, you cannot sustain that because it's just you. We find when we get to this this age that is helping others or doing for others or connecting in some way. You know, when you're depressed, the best way to get yourself out of the depression is to help another person. Mm -hmm. And when you're, when everything you do is for a higher purpose than you, you don't have time to be depressed or even to be unhealthy. You have a purpose to solve. And you know, that purpose is what gets you out of bed. That purpose is what keeps you healthy. That purpose is what tells you inside that you need you to be well, to be to move on and to continue fulfilling that purpose. You have a purpose in your change of POV. You've seen my purpose. I am driven by this purpose. It's part of my it's part of what keeps me healthy. So when we retire, 
we have to find what we are going to devote our lives to if it's not going to be the job. Mm. Especially men, they, you know, I'm a workaholic and I've devoted my entire life to software and working for the companies I've worked for. And when that all goes away, you can feel empty. And, you know, I was starting to feel that at around the time of 52, thereabouts. But by the time I had my accident, I knew that I had to seek something that was higher than myself. And when that accident happened, it was like a light bulb went off. I had to connect myself to others in order to stay well, in order to heal, in order to be the person that I've always been, plus more. Mm. So, as as you begin to age, or as you are aging, what are what are some things that you find the most difficult? Is it uh, is it keeping up with exercise? Is it keeping up with the proper diet? Is it you know, what are some of the challenges as you grow older that you that you face? Well, that's a this is one man's answer, but I think the most difficult challenge for me between 40 and let's say 66 is trying to understand that I'm no longer 40. Mm. <laughs> because, you know, like I may still look the part of a younger man, but my years are 66. I get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and I can feel like I'm 66. Mm. Um, you know, like I remember a time when I, when my joints were more free flowing, but I don't regret any of that. I don't, it's not a loss. I don't feel a, an erosion of my body. I still have a, a decent muscular that they, they call me the grandfather of strength at my local gyms. You know, like, and I love showing off my physical strength. And you, as you know, I do handstands all over the place, primarily just to entertain people. <laughs> but, you know, like, for me, I have it's also, also a sense of time. I have to grab time and rush to make a mark. Now, this is really a wrong way for me to think because I've been practicing my entire life to be 66. There is no rush. I am here. I am here. I didn't really realize this when I when I was younger, but at 66, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Mm. I'm right where I'm supposed to be at 66. And, you know, I've practiced for 66 years to be here without me ever knowing that I've been practicing. Mm. And to find the contentment and satisfaction inside myself and around me, you know, Six, older people are much happier than they give themselves the impression to be. You can see an older person limp along with a walker or struggle with a disability that comes from an age-related situation, and you sort of project into him that he feels bad about this. Believe me, I have a bad leg from that accident. I don't feel bad about that at all. Mm. Not at all. The infirmities that other people will see in the elderly are not the infirmities that the elderly see in themselves. Mm. I forget where I saw it, but I saw a very inspiring video of a man in a wheelchair building a barbecue grill from with brick and mortar, lifting sandbags, all from a wheelchair. Do you think this man really is compromised in life? He is building a a, he's doing something I can't do from a wheelchair. Mm. Yeah. You know? So, you know, like how bad can elderly people be? Believe me, it's, it's, you know, I have aching joints. I still do a handstand and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so my shoulders give me problems. I still do all I do and enjoy it. You know, our pains are just pains. You know, my son complains of pains. I complain of pains. Mm. It's the human body. But I am just so fascinated with what the body is capable of. I've just seen so much of that, not just from me, but from others as well. And uh, so uh, let me ask you, so you get a lot of places that are, you know, like senior citizen communities where you got to be above, you know, 50 or 60 or whatever to even live in these communities. Um, yes. And you and they're all I mean, depends on where you go. The population of those types of communities may grow. You go down the go down to Florida and they have entire places <laughs> called the villages, right? Where it's That's pretty right. much all of that. 
So is so let me ask you, why do places like that, in your opinion, exist? Is it because older people just want to associate with people their own age and they're just done with the younger demographic? Or uh, is it because they, they can't relate uh, the older generation from the younger generation and it's just easier to – like explain to me why that phenomenon happens. Well, it's not a phenomenon that I really agree with, but we – you know – there's a lot of stuff going on in our society, and we can often have mistaken ideas about where what we don't want to see in our society is coming from. And it's very easy to blame that which you are not. Um, and so um, so I find a lot of older people don't want to be messing with kids. A lot of older people feel more comfortable in being around other older people. I myself don't quite feel that way because I feel there's real value in hanging around people of all ages. In fact, one of the steps that I put in my book for Inner Game of Aging is to make sure that you have friends 15 to 20 years younger than you and 15 to 20 years older than you. To have a strong set of friends in that age group is is vital to keep you connected, to keep your mind sharp, to keep you exposed to new things. And, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure if I, how I feel about living in a, you know, 55 and over community or retirement community. They're now even starting to do an experiment, Ed. Now, this is interesting. They're giving college students free room and board if they will live in the nursing home. Oh, wow. In a, or, or in an assisted living facility. So they don't have to pay room and board, rent or anything, as long as they will attend college living in the assisted living place. Now, th what this does is bring the old and young together, which is, it's a tremendous connection device. Mm. And yeah, to keep people engaged in what all of life is not to just focus on, you know, your little, you know, sphere. And so I can appreciate things like that. I heard about that experiment and was very intrigued. You know, college kids hanging around assisted living. But you have the things that go on in that environment. I was reading about it and it was very interesting. You have older people relying on the younger people, older people talking to the younger people and vice versa. We have so much wisdom in our older people that these younger people are now getting the benefit of that wisdom. Yeah, so you bring you bring up a good point, and and I just want your take on this. Um, the the older generation brings with it a lifetime of experience and history and knowledge, um, and 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 often it seems that the younger demographic just doesn't take advantage of that experience. I mean, absolutely. This, this, absolutely. I, I understand this world is a fast moving, a fast paced environment, highly, you know, uh, technological and, and, and a lot of people of the older demographic may not be as astute in technology as the younger, but it's it, life is more than technology. Once you turn off the computers and the phones and, and all of those things that, that blink and flash and ring, uh, you're really left with, at the end of the day, your life and life experiences, and and Absolutely. I and, and I think that's something that's lost in this country because, and I would have never known it um, if I hadn't visited other countries. Like I did a, a year in Korea, where uh, the the older folks were considered elders, and elder means more than just your age. They're they're people that are the 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 monarchs of the family and mm. and they mm. they sit atop basically uh, not not I'm not 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 mafia style in in any way but but they're people that are uh, regard uh, that are put into a position of high regard and they're and the the younger generations of that family go and seek advice and opinion and the and, and the advice and opinions of these monarchs are highly regarded and, and course, taken into consideration. Course. And the same thing I found in, in Iraq when I was there for a year. Um, elders um, held a very high position within the family. Um, and it was very, very few times anyone would make any big decisions within their family without consulting their elders. And so where did that 
go. I don't really see that a whole lot well, in, the, in this country. It's funny because you mentioned technology. Now, the elders of any culture are the repository of its traditions, the repository of the patterns of life that surround that culture. The older brain is more capable of discerning the patterns of life. You know, if we want to look into the sky and predict the weather three days from now, like they did in American Indian times, it's the older brain that recognizes those patterns much more so than the younger brain. It's the older brain that has you know, solved many more pro problems. There's a wealth of information and experience that comes from the older mind. Now, you mentioned technology, which is changing our culture and our society. Yes, this is true. But you as a person is not much different than you as a person 200 years ago, right? We are still driven by the same thing. So there's a part of us that is not being affected by technology that can more easily be seen by those of us who are older. And of course, technology changing things, we have to come up to speed, things are changing very fast. You can hear this discrepancy because things are changing very fast because of technology and the elders are the repository of the traditions, the problem solving techniques that have been timeless, all the timeless values in our culture are held on by the older people. In other cultures, as you said, the elder people, it's a challenge to arrive at this spot. I want to get to this spot where I am a revered elder. In this culture, it is not a revered spot. It is, we have lost the national treasure that is the wisdom of our elders. There's such a treasure there that this culture does not take advantage of because we've put them aside because we're a fast moving environment because they don't have a lot to offer to our bottom line, mm. you know, which is not really true at all. You know, it's a, it's an impression that's, that's put into the culture to, you know, because we need to, yeah, I, I, for whatever reason, I can get into the political stuff. I don't want to do that, but, <laughs> but the, but we need to understand that the value of our older people is in the billions at this point in time. If you want to measure this by dollars, the, for example, baby boomers controlled 70% of this nation's discretionary, discretionary input. You know, that's a big power. Now we have to pay attention to what they're going to buy and our profit motive is going to encourage us to pay attention to our elders. <laughs> so, you know, again, if we end up at the right place because of a profit motive, I don't know how far that can carry forward. However, it is what it is. I, my message right now is trying to help others to understand that our heart is just as strong as it always has been in terms of our will to make life good. Yeah. So, so on that note, let's talk about, let's talk about health and in terms of, uh, exercise and diet mm. and and everybody wow. talks about exercise and diet and and everything and but what's funny is anytime you watch a commercial that talk that that's advertising exercise and diet it always it's always a 20 something with a six pack right <laughs> right yeah. uh, you don't usually see somebody that's 66 years old or 70 years old on these commercials advertising uh that's right you know uh, fitness exercise and diet but but we all know um, if it's if it's important as a twenty year old to to eat well and to get exercise, and it's got to be equally important to those that Absolutely. are aging. So, what's been your experience, or how how important or how correlated is health and fitness and diet to aging gracefully? And I say I say gracefully because uh, maybe that's the wrong word. Um, aging, no, it's the right word. Effectively, because uh, let's let's face it, people that don't eat well or healthily or, or, or exercise regularly. Um, I mean, it's blunt, but they're going to have a shorter lifespan. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But you know, like it, you know, we, ha we have to take care of our bodies. Of course, you know, that's what God has given us to live. That's what we record life through the, my, my philosophy is to keep moving no matter 
you know, when you hurt a joint, when you, no matter what you do, just keep moving. If you, you know, walk every day, you know, you've got to, I tend to do more than most because I'm a maniac. I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> um, but when I get hurt and I do get hurt occasionally, I cannot rest that joint. I don't want to stress it, but I just have to keep it moving. Always keep moving, Ed. Always, always, always. You know, you're act like a kid. You know, you're 40 years old. Is that a grown man? No, it's never, you're never going to grow into a grown man. Just get rid of that impression and, you know, play, play in your work, play in your, you know, in your play. So as far as exercise goes, there's, there's a concept that is an extremely important to me in understanding my exercise and the exercise of others. Let me speak about this a little bit more carefully because it drives just about everything I can do. It is a concept that I call better. No matter where you are, no matter what you are doing, if you want to, you can do that thing better. The human is a very strange animal. Just like most animals on this earth, the more he does anything, the more he can do that thing. The more he jumps, the more he can jump. The more he reads, the more he can read. The more he loves, the more he can love. And this is without exception. The more you do that which you cannot do, the better you can do that which you cannot do until you cannot say you can't do it anymore. I know the grammar for that is mixed up, but the concept is, in, is sound. And so I believe that in doing anything, if I walked a block today, because that's all I can walk, then tomorrow I can walk a block and one step more, and I have achieved my purpose. Mm. If I walked a block and one step more that day, then the next day or possibly even the next week, I can go better than that. Now, using that concept, there is no telling how far we can go. None of us know our limits. None of us know our limits. I am still finding out how strong I can be, how physically strong I can be. And so if you're lifting weights, you know, if you lifted 100 pounds today, what's stopping you from lifting 101 pounds tomorrow? You can always do better. If you play the piano so well today, just a week's more practice has you better. You may, it's like a star, Ed. You can never reach a star, but it always gives you the direction to strive, strive mm. for. And so using such a concept, if, I, if one week I ate clean, well, I can always eat cleaner. I cheat on my diet quite a bit. I can cheat less next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, like, uh, I'm sure you've cheated on your diet. You can cheat less. No matter what you're doing, the only thing that stops you from getting better at anything that you want is your own desire. Hmm. There's, there's, as long as you have a desire to be better, you can get better at anything. There are those people who believe that we are what we are. I don't quite agree. I believe that we can make ourselves and create ourselves over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but by doing better each time, I am now doing getting into podcasting and having a hell of a time. I am refining my process, my podcast process, better and better each time. As long as that's what I want, then that better is available to me. What are my limits? I have no idea. But all I have to do is go better and better each day, or as whatever interval I'm using, and I will, will I ever hit my limits then? I have no idea. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned your podcast in the inner game of aging, which is a, a relatively new podcast. So let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, where did that concept of that idea come from? Where did that inspiration, where was that born out of? Well, um, I have, you know, being my age, of course, I have many older friends and, I saw a lot of them in pain. As they got older and older, they started to doubt themselves more in the technological environment they're in. Remember, I'm a software engineer. And that's a, you know, that's a many young people hanging around that career. And as my friends got older and older, they started to doubt 
themselves, their own capability, their own sense more and more. And I was figuring, trying to figure out why this is happening. You know, maybe I'm losing it, I would hear. You know, maybe it's time for me to retire. I can't keep up with these young kids, et cetera. I'm just trying to figure out where this is coming from. And then I, I retired myself and felt this loss of structure. And I realized that aging is what we tell ourselves. There's this, the spiritual mental side of aging is what we tell ourselves. There's an inner game here. The way we think really affects the way we live. It, there's a direct connection between thinking and living. And when I looked around, I said, we can all do better. We can all feel better about aging. Even me, I, I feel pretty good about aging. And so the inner game of aging is about understanding the issues that affect us as older people, to understand how to navigate these issues, the issues that are in the culture, the issues that are inside our own heart, the things we struggle with inside and outside, and to talk about them like a successful death, for example, to bring death close to us, to make it more of a conversation that, you know, that we can have successfully. Aging is not all about the empowerment that I speak of. There's some harsh realities to aging as well. You know, it's not the wrinkles that we see that really bother us, but it's the mortality that you mentioned. How much have we accomplished with our lives? What sort of legacy have we left behind? Um, and how fit are we to do these things that represent our last and final chapters? You know, we want to be strong for our entire life in order to make our mark where our mark is supposed to be made. And, you know, to leave this world silently is not an attractive image for me. I want to leave a mark that says Lee was here. The baby boomer generation was the greatest generation in terms of its effect on the world. And we want to leave a mark on the world that says this has happened, a mark in history that says this has happened. So the inner game of aging sort of talks about how we can make our last mark, how we can see our environment, how we can navigate through our, our culture to correct the mistakes that we made as a generation. When I say mistakes that we made as a generation, when we were children, teens, young adults, we turned what was a we into a me. That's what the baby boomers did. And all of society took that on. We became so me focused. But the baby boomers have now seen the errors of their ways and are turning that me back into a we. And I see this all around me. And I even see this now influencing the younger people like yourself. You know, you're looking to help people and you're not as driven by the profit motive. Where is this coming from? Well, certainly there's an element in the society that's promoting this sort of good thing. But, you know, like the baby boomers are changing themselves and p pushing this kind of element back into society as well. And we'll influence everything, you know, as we have all along. The inner game of aging is, I'm going to say, um, it's a game because we are given many puzzles to solve. For example, medical medical issues. Navigating the medical industry these days, Ed, is just damn near impossible. And if you go through this with a heavy heart, it'll guaranteed make you old. You will feel so old <laughs> in dealing with the medical industry, you know, keeping track. But it, Again, turning it into a game, I have many issues that I have to deal with in my podcast that talk about dealing with the medical industry as a as a bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like there's just so many things that help us stay young. I want to highlight them all. It's not all about getting old and dying. It's about leaving a mark. It's about enjoying your life. It's about having others enjoy you and to help the world that you're leaving behind. Mm, that's nice. For 66 years of experience, how today would you define success? Because I'm sure 
success to you when you were 20 is different than when you were 40 and is probably Absolutely. different now than yours. So as 66 years young, what now is your definition of success? Uh, that's a very interesting question as well. And, you know, like, because I have seen my thoughts change over the years. What I used to think about family and love and money at 20 was different than what it was at 40 and is different now at 66. You know, for me, success at 66 has much less to do with my material side, more to do with my spiritual side, my connections, my fitness, how healthy I am, how, how much I can influence the world, how many people I can touch. That's really what it's about. How many people I can touch, how many people I can make just have a positive effect on their lives. That would be success and how I can, how much I can enjoy having that effect on them. Mm. And so, you know, like, it's not a question, of course, I don't mind money. I never do, but, but the, to make my money just for the sake of making money, that just seems useless to me now. You know, to have money, just to have money, it just seems so used. It did. It felt reasonable when I was young. It just doesn't feel reasonable now anymore. You know, I'd rather, I I would rather, I would rather make my money slowly and help people. Mm. You know, at 66, I just wanted to make, excuse me, at 40 or 30, I just wanted to make money. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my heart seems so much more important to me now. My intentions, my care and love for the world my friends, my family. These are the true legacies that I leave behind. However little or much money I leave behind, that's immaterial. Mm. You know, you know, when I die, they're going to say he had a full wallet. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's what, it'll be on your gravestone. Here lies Lee. He had a lot of money in the bank. What a great guy. Right? Exactly. <laughs> you know, you know, like, I, you know, they say it's lonely at the top. All these CEOs who make lots and lots of money. You know, um, I just want to have a good, well-balanced life. And there's so many experiences around this world. I want to have all these experiences. I can't do that if I don't exercise, if I don't eat right, if I'm focused on, you know, working and not developing my relationships. The sort of experience I've had because of the new experience, new relationships I've developed over the past two years has been tremendous. How can I? I turn away from this. We got people that I know that are of my age, right, or even younger, 35 to 40 years old. And I've had people of that age when I talk about, you know, entrepreneurism, starting their own business. And they say, oh, man, it's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of late to the party. It's late for me to get started, right? And they're, they're saying this at 35, 40. Um, and, and sometimes even it, me personally at 40, I look back on these 16 and 17 year old entrepreneurs that are just being, are, are extremely successful in their field. And it's, it's easy to kind of say, oh man, I'm, I'm behind the eight ball. But now you get into the 66 years old, year old range, right? Um, is that too late to give up on your dreams or things that you've maybe even uh, never considered before? I mean, I, two years ago, did you ever consider doing a podcast? I, not, not at all. Not at all. I right. mean, you know, I, I didn't th- okay. I'm 66. Am I ever going to make it to the Olympics? Mm, maybe not. But I, <laughs> if I were to aim for that, I can get closer than I am today. Yeah. There's, there's always better. It's just mm. that I may not reach the level, levels that will put me where I want to, but there's always better than what I am now. I never thought I'd be starting a business at 66. And it's been a truly exciting ride. Mm-hmm. It has not been what I thought it was. The age is not a factor. You know, consider our lifespan these days, you know, when we were when, in our father's time and grandfather's time, 65 was near the end of your life. Now, 90 is near the end of your life. We have another 30 years to do another career. I'm going to embark on another career. I'm not going to ever retire from it. You know, this is what 66 years means to me, the freedom to do and to work in the way that I've wanted to work and to work on the things that I wanted to work and to help the people that I wanted to see. It's never too late. You know, you're seven years old and you want to get in shape. 
that's not too difficult. I've watched my body recover from devastation. We can, we can heal. We can get better. We, we can live the way we're supposed to and move toward the body, the mind, the passion that creates life. I look at it this way, Ed. Consider a tree, a tree that's in the ground in a very poor environment, no sun, no water. That tree is going to be very sickly as it grows. But if you take that tree after it has proven to be very sickly and move it to a better environment, it doesn't get better right away, but it starts to get healthier and healthier and healthier. I've used that image in my own life because as I live cleaner and cleaner, my body gets healthier, my mind gets sharper, my engagement and energy in life gets stronger. And where's the limit to that? I have no idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, what if I was all I was ever supposed to be? What would that feel like? I have no idea. All I know, Ed, is I'm working toward that. Yeah, I think it's an important message for everyone listening that the ceilings that the ceilings of our potentials that we've set for ourselves are imposed by us and us alone, right? Abs- absolutely, couldn't and, agree more. And so, if we if we are limited, and why? Bennett and I are going through this uh, 30 and 60 day well fit challenge. And we've talked a lot about limiting beliefs and, uh, yes. and, and the idea behind, you know, the only thing keeping us from doing the things that we want to do are the stories that we tell ourselves for the Absolutely. reasons why we can't. Right. And it's Absolutely. those limiting beliefs, right? When you are trying to embark on something that you've always wanted to do, what are, what are you telling yourself to prevent yourself from doing it? I'm too old. I'm too, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't have enough education. I don't, that's right. I don't have enough time. Yeah, no, whatever, right? Um, yeah, that's so, my favorite one. I don't yeah, have the time. Me too. Uh, that's me too, right? We all, we all do it. So let me ask you this. This is a little bit of an abstract question, but I, I'm very excited to hear your answer. Let's assume now that you are in an auditorium and you are about to speak to a thousand 20-year-old individuals. They're, they're, they're filing into this auditorium. Now, here's the kicker. As they walk into the auditorium, they're handed a pill, right? And they're and they're taking this this pill, and uh, and this pill, and and they have to take this pill, and I'll explain why. <laughs> I'll explain why, because the pill, once they ingest this pill, it it causes them to believe everything that you're about to tell them. And the ah. reason and the reason why that pill is so important because I have a 20-year-old son and not to single him out, but this is probably <laughs> true for most 20-year-olds. When it was true for me when I was 20, right? When I was 20 and I heard something from somebody that was 40, I didn't believe it, right? I was uh. making up my own mind. But now that I'm 40 and I'm saying things to a 20-year-old, I think back and like, man, if I had only been able to believe the things that people that were 40 were telling me when I was 20, where would I Mm. be today at 40? But it's nice because now at 40, I understand that. And so when I talk to people like you that are 66, (laughs) I I get a lot more out of that conversation because I put myself in that 20 year old shoes and I say, all right, now I have enough wisdom at 40 to appreciate what I'm being told at by the 66 year old. Right? So that's why the importance, that's why the necessity for this pill, because what it does is it forces these 20 year olds to actually be in the position of a 40 year old to actually believe what it is you're about to say. Okay, well, so- my my son had to take that pill recently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, he has been working night and day on a job that he actually likes and he's doing very well at, but he's overworking himself. One evening, I hope he doesn't mind me telling you the story. He called me at midnight, rather late for him, and I can hear a tear in his voice. He was crying. What's the matter, son? Well, I've been working to meet this deadline, as you know, Dad, and I've been working very hard. Yes, I've been warning you about working very hard. Well, Emily, his girlfriend, planned a surprise for me on the day this project is due. I am fearful for this deadline. I don't want to disappoint Emily. And I am not taking this well. I'm having a nervous breakdown, I suspect. I told him the following, and here goes the pill. I said, Jarrett, my son, I'm going to tell you something that I would not have listened to when I was in that same position. And I don't expect you to listen to it 
either. Here it goes. You will go into the office in the morning, tell your boss that you cannot meet this deadline and go enjoy Emily's surprise. Now, I would not have followed that advice. I would not. Why? Because my mind is too connected to my work to even think about doing that. But in the long run, that's what would have worked for me. Now, I don't know what you'll do, but that's what I should have done. And if you told me I should have done that, I would not have agreed with you. Mm -hmm. You do what you wish. Three days later, he said, after that phone call, I got a good night's sleep. I saw in the morning that I could not meet that deadline. There was no point to me not making the deadline and not taking in Emily's surprise. Thank you, Dad. So his bitter pill came from almost a nervous breakdown, having a nervous breakdown with too many things colliding in on him. And so, but I was, I was really surprised because I would not have taken that advice that when I was his age, I would have continued, tried to meet the deadline fruitlessly and missed out on the surprise. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so for 20 year olds to be advised by six year olds, it's a very valuable thing if they can hold themselves in that position but we're too immersed in technology and there's not much an older person can tell a younger person about their passion, technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, but, like. So what advice would you give to those thousand 20 year olds that have now taken the pill and are completely <laughs> open to anything that you have to say? What would you say, technology aside, about mm -hmm. life and worth and success? Great. Great question, Ed. The, you are 20 years old, I might say. You have yet to understand how important you are. You have yet to understand how important your feelings are. You have yet to understand who you truly are. A lot of that at 20 is hidden from you. One, because of the passion of youth, the the craze of excitement about entering into the world. But when you discover who you really are, and it'll take many years to do that, you'll be surprised at how little you know now. In fact, I can assure you, and here goes where you will not listen to me. The more you know, the more you learn, the more you will realize you did not know. <laughs> that's right. Yes, that's right. Just and, and it's and here's the thing: just because you don't know doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? There, exactly. There's so many things out there that exist, and it, you're oblivious to it because you don't. And so uh, I can go on and on about things that I have learned along the way, things that have changed my perspective, my point of view, which is really That's the, right. it's the it's the essence of this show. And so That's right. we are we've completely consumed all of our available time. And I wanted to first say thank you, Lee, for coming on to the show and sharing. It's been a us. Pleasure. I love I mean, just the idea of having somebody of your expertise and your years of knowledge. Um, and experience is invaluable to me and I hope to the listeners as well. So in closing and keeping in spirit of this show, uh, the final question that I have for you, and then uh, after you answer, then I will uh, get into a little bit more of your specifics mm -hmm. of where people can find you. But uh, so changing your perspective, give us a time or an instance where you thought something one way or believed something one way. Um, and an event or circumstance occurred that forced you to see things from a different perspective. What was it and what did you learn from that experience? At 66 years old, there's been many things like that. One of the more significant ones is um, my relationship with my wife. Uh, you know, like my wife is a wonderful person. You know, she has helped us. For so many years, I couldn't survive without her. She's been, you know, the backbone of my everyday existence. There was a time when the difficulties she and I would sometimes have, I would feel one way, almost as if it was 
something was being done deliberately. My wife, for some reason or other, I had a revelation. My wife is is a beautiful person. She's she may be thinking differently than I do. She has different images in her head, and that's okay. There's nothing that says that she has to be like me. The revelation that I had that had to change where I had to change my point of view is I realized that I was treating my wife the way I would want to be treated, not the way that she wants to be treated. This was important to me because not many people want to be treated the way I want to be treated. <laughs> I'm a thick skinned, insensitive individual who responds to challenge. You know? <laughs> and not everybody wants to be treated that way. You know, that'll work with me, may, may even work with you, but you know, it doesn't work on everyone. And I realized that my wife was treating me as if I was the sort of person that she was. So I helped my wife to see these changes of expense perspective, you know, me having the change of perspective that she is who she is. She's not Lee Moa. She doesn't respond to the world the way I do. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I have to find a way to care for her and to foster the person she is rather than the person I want it to be. This was a tremendous change of perspective. I'm still struggling with this, by the way. I'm no angel. We all have our, <laughs> our struggles. And, but this has been the basis of a rejuvenation of my marriage, which is still being discussed. <laughs> um, and I'm very happy that that change was made inside of me. This is not a change I asked for my wife, but to see my wife as a different person than me, rather than me, you know, she does not respond to things the way I do. Why should she? She's a different person. She doesn't evaluate or see things. She's not wrong in doing this. This was important for me, Ed. Mm. And I don't know if I would have seen this at 35 or 40. I'm the, you know, they say that aging turns you into the person you always should have been. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's maybe this is what I always should have seen. So that was, for me, that was the, mm. mo the biggest change of perspective that I've had to make. And how long have you been married now? <laughs> 45, 46, somewhere between there and forever. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, imp it's important though. I mean, that's, a, that's an incredible lesson uh, to take away because I've been married uh, almost 20 years, which is a long time, especially, yes, I mean, the, in, these days, I mean, 20 years is a long time compared to, you know, 46 but it's important to know that, um, you know, even though we've been married for 20 years, in 20 more, we still <laughs> have to work on our relationship. It doesn't, Absolutely. It doesn't just uh, automatically just click into place after so many years. It still requires, we're still individuals, we're still human beings, and we still, still have growing. our own needs. Right. It's, it's yeah. still growing, changing. You know, my, my whole environment wasn't prepared for the me that came out of my accident. Mm -hmm. Right, <laughs> and it took a long time for my environment to adjust to who I had become from my accident. Mm. You know? So, um, but it's, I'm telling you, it's been at 66, Ed. I couldn't be happier. I feel fit, strong. You know, I feel clean. I feel purposed. I feel energized. You know, is, is the 66 supposed to feel like this? Why not? Yeah, I mean, you. Yeah. Uh, after all, you've got the the best forty year old friend in the world, right? <laughs> I mean, well, that's that's the. Best. I've suggested that to to myself as well, but it's yeah. still debatable. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah. All right, Lee. Well, hey, where can people find more about you and what you've got going on, and and your oh. podcast and your website and uh, all of that? Well, um, I have I have several sites. I am obsolescing a previous site I had called GrowthWorks, and I am now going to be found on a new site called The Inner Game of Aging. In fact, that's what the podcast is called. That's what the ebook, when it's released, will be called, The Inner Game of Aging. Is, you that, can, a, is that .com, .org? That's .com, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, now, you can find the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher. There will be on a few more as well. It's a new podcast. It's been, it was released about three or four weeks ago. And I'm already appreciative of the reviews and the downloads. So things are happening there. I'm excited to give out this message. I'm looking forward for a tremendous path. And I have to thank you, Ed, 
because you have been a tremendous help. You've been patient with me. I know you've been a bit irritated at times, but you've been very patient with me, this old dinosaur trying to figure <laughs> out this new technology. You know, no, so. <laughs> it's, it's awesome. I, and I, it, you know what, Lee? I mean, we're in a mastermind group together, and we mm. made, we, as, as a mastermind member, we've committed to each other. That's and right. I would help anyone that needed help. Uh, but with you, I really do honestly believe in this message because in the short amount of time that I've worked with you on your message and your podcast, and a part of my role in, in helping you with this is to, is to review the podcast episodes and give you feedback. And just listening to the episodes, on, on one hand, I'm looking for, uh, I'm trying to listen for, you know, uh, technical, te technical feedback improvements that I can offer you. But while I'm doing that, I'm actually learning things that I totally didn't even expect to be learning, <laughs> and it's it's incredible. So really quick, I know you got you got five episodes that are released right now, and your first episode is really just an introduction of the show. Mm. Um, but briefly run through the the interviews that you've done so far, and what were those topics? I just want to give my listeners a little bit of a taste of what type of uh, conversations you're having. Oh, this is very interesting. The and the second episode involved uh, patient advocacy. Now, patient advocacy is where we have someone, as a patient, we have someone advocate for us in the medical industry. Now, this episode was extremely insightful to me because there's so many things that the medical industry hides from us, doesn't want us to know. More than half the medical bills that are sent out have errors in them. The, the statistics are just extreme. And we touch upon all this in episode two. In episode three, I have an old friend of mine who has cured his macular degeneration and is very much involved with Alzheimer's and the, his treatments. And he's done some personal research, research that helped him cure reverse, actually reverse his macular degeneration, which he was diagnosed with quite reliably. And that was all done through diet. That's right. That's yeah. right. You know, we, we will find out. We are destined to find out that it's our lifestyle that's causing our problems, not our age or anything else. Mm -hmm. Our lifestyle is what's causing our problems. The fourth episode was where I speak to an elderly man, 90 years old, to try to explore his views how they have changed over the years. He's told me some very funny stories. We tried to capture them in the episode. It's very insightful to see how a 90-year-old sees the world after living so long. The fifth episode is where we explore just the tip of the iceberg of elder abuse. This conversation is extremely lively, and it's not what you think it is at all. But he does give some very valuable tips if you have an if you have an older, you know, person that you're taking care of, or your parents, or something like that. Please listen to this article because you can spot some very dangerous things that could exist in their life. The sixth episode, episode which will be released, connects tries to understand the connection between spirituality and aging. We find that as we go older, get older, that we start to discover our own soul. We start to explore why this is the case. I speak with a hospice chaplain of all things, and there we start to explore the concept of a successful death. Hmm. Wow, that's an oxymoron, man. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was, it was a, yeah, it didn't seem like an oxymoron to me, but as I speak the concept around from that conversation, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Now, the, we have many episodes planned that have some very intriguing possibilities. For example, a uh, a recently new friend of mine has discovered a way to help older people through drumming. Mm -hmm. And and we explore how he does this. And you know, it's very interesting how he the benefits that come from the workshops that he does. And so we explore all that. Like I know it's an oxymoron, a successful death, leaving a legacy, understanding our grandchildren. And, and how important they are, or even the importance of your spouse. These are things that empower you. Walking around with bad relationships at this age is a tremendous burden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be 70 years old 
and surround yourself with bad relationships is a burden that nobody should have to live through. Mm. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to help others understand. It's our social connection. It's our relationships that determines how healthy and how engaged we are in life. Mm. So, um, so we have some tremendous episodes. I'm very happy that you've listened to them. I'm encourage all you, all of your listeners to pick up on this. I believe no matter how young you are, there's something there for everyone. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree. I couldn't agree with you more. As a matter of fact, this would have been a show where if I were just scrolling through, you know, looking for new podcasts, which I do, you know, quite often, um, if I would have stumbled across the inner game of aging, that wouldn't have been one that I would have probably selected because, one, it's at forty. You don't want to. You don't want to face the fact that you're getting old and you're going to be old someday. Some because you know a lot of people don't see value in in aging. Whereas, yeah. whereas that I do. It, well, the, your podcast actually demonstrates, and working with you demonstrates that that's that's not a, a negative process that we have to endure, no, but it's a positive thing to look forward to. So, I highly encourage anybody that, uh, regardless of their age, if you are interested in um, getting old, and I hope hopefully you <laughs> you are, because you're you're going to inevitably one way or the other. Um, or if you've perhaps got somebody in your life that is elder, uh, maybe uh, you're taking care of them or you have somebody taking care of them or perhaps they're in an assisted living type environment um, or you just want to understand uh, where older people are coming from to help close that gap. I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you, Lee, um, I, I don't generally keep friends of uh, that are your age. I mean, Ooh. you and I, I don't think we would have ever had just met one day and just started to become friends if it weren't for our uh, mastermind group. Well, and... don't don't say that, Ed. I regularly befriend people who are 20 years younger than me and people who are 20 years older than me. Oh, if you I... do. You do. But I, I that's ne- that was never anything that I would have even considered. Oh, uh, I, you know I would have I mean? spotted you and said, that guy's going to be my friend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't care what he thinks. He's going to be my friend. <laughs> but, you know, just by getting and, and here's the thing. I'll be honest. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time talking with, with people that were outside of my age bracket, whatever that Mm -hmm. is considered. Um, but when I got back from my deployment in Iraq and I got out of the military, um, I found it much easier to approach, you know, the old veterans walking, you know, in down the aisles at the store with a veteran hat, with a Korean war or world war two or Vietnam hat on. And I found it easier to talk to them, uh, walk up and talk to them because we, we, we shared something in common. And I thought that, I thought that maybe, you know, we, in order for, for us to bridge the gap, we've got to have or find things that, that we have in common or common ground. But the fact that we're human and the fact that we have feelings and the fact that we all, right. regardless of age, aspire to be and to do, um, it should be common ground enough to be able to close that gap. So thank you, Lee, for teaching me, so well. teaching so me well. that lesson. At, uh, and, I, and I look forward to every week when we meet in our mastermind group for the wisdom that you bring. I, I, it's a trade-off. I, I help share in the knowledge that I have from a technical standpoint in what I do in my business but mm. I learned from you uh, in a lifestyle, in a, in a frame of reference, in a frame of mind from someone that's 66 and in hopes that I can become a much better man sooner <laughs> than I would have otherwise. <laughs> if if I I had, had... <laughs> it's funny. I, if I had discovered this way of living when I was 40, I would have been a better 66-year-old. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. but, but, you know, like I watch you. You and you seem so similar to me. And to be able to influence you, I am grateful. I am honored because you feel like you have a lot of power behind you. You resemble me quite a bit when I remember myself at 40. And if I can help you not make some of the mistakes I've made in my own extreme passion, Mm. you know, for success and for other things. But, you know, like I've appreciated our friendship. I'm hoping that it stays around and I would like to see what you look like at 66. Yeah. (laughs) And and it's, and it's awesome because, um, just, uh, a couple of days ago, as a matter of fact, I got a text from, from someone. It's actually, uh, my son's best friend 
he is in the Navy, and he's 20 years old. Mm. Um, and so if, if we were to do this, right, he's 20, I'm 40 or 60 plus, right? Mm. Uh, and, and this is what I got, and this is what his text says. It says, hey, he goes, hey, I'm going to start my own vlog, maybe even a podcast, and I wanted to let you know that you inspire me to do one myself. And so it's really excellent, about, excellent. you know, it's about <laughs> finding a common ground. It's about inspiring others to do and to be more than they thought they could, could Absolutely. do or be. Uh, and, and it doesn't, you could be at 20, you could be at 40, you could be at 60, or you could be at 80. Right. It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't matter. Right. People start getting in shape at 70 years old, and by 76, they're in the best shape of their lives yep. than they've ever been. Right. Yeah. Um, so we don't know where our limits are, Ed. You know, where's the limits of my podcast? I have no idea. All I know is it can get better. Where's the limits of my strength, my fitness? All I know is it can get better. You know, yeah. we all have our challenges. I have my foot. You know, um, you know, health problems that have to be seen. Yeah, you know, but it can all get better. All I'm looking for is better. Mm -hmm. And as long as I take better step by step. I never know when I can't take that next step. I just keep on going. That's just right. Keep on going. I learned so. a lot. I learned a lot about you tonight, and I appreciate your time. I'm I'm gonna get you a bedpan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use it as a tambourine. <laughs> You can do it. If you want to get me a real tambourine, you can, you know. <laughs> All right, folks. Uh, thank you, okay. Lee, for coming on the show. I really I appreciate, appreciate it. it. All right, folks, that concludes this episode of Change Your POV Podcast. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Lee as much as I did. A lot of great information. What a great guy. And I look forward to having our very own mascot, Lee Moa, come back on the show with some more updates and everything that, that uh, he's got going on. Love hearing from him. And so does, the, so does the listening audience, you guys. So to find out everything that we talked about today, head on over to changeyourpov.com forward slash episode 91. Never miss an episode. Hit subscribe on your podcast player of choice. We have a lot more great content headed your way. Connect with us over on Facebook by heading over to our community page at Change Your POV Squad. Or check out all the other videos and crazy stuff that me and Bennett have going on over at our uh, regular Facebook group, or not a group, our regular Facebook page at Change Your POV. All right, folks, until next time. Thanks for listening to Change Your POV podcast with Eddie Lazary. Check out more content by going to changeyourpov.com. And remember, your ability and willingness to change your point of view will open doors of opportunity.